and he's sending me pictures of his new apartment and the park that surrounds it. From the time on his email to the time that I got it, it was 1.2 minutes total. I've got a satellite dish sitting out there pointed at the sky. He's got a satellite phone. He shoots it up the satellite. The satellite shoots it down to me in a minute and a half later. I have eight by 10 pictures of what he's showing me. It's a beautiful area in Shanghai. Fantastic words, pictures, communications of all types, live speech. It's easy. If you ever have one of these phones where your thumbs get a workout, okay? My family's been after me to have one. They say they want to communicate with me. I refuse. I'll handle smoke signals. You're a good man, Rick. I like that. I'll handle smoke signals, okay? I'll handle handshakes. I'll even wave across the street if I see you. But if you think for one minute I'm going to spend all my time sitting there with my thumbs, going on the telephone like this so I can communicate on how to boil water, better think again. <laughs> how many times a day does the average person get interrupted by their cell phone? Zero. Eleven times a day. <laughs> Eleven times a day. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I have trouble. Modern communications are marvelous until they affect what I want to do. It's amazing. I watched the pictures from Mars. Little thing looked like an ant with wheels on it, rolling around taking pictures. Close-up pictures of Mars. We got them here on Earth by satellite in something like six minutes complete for an eight by ten. Amazing. You know, I love this age, but it's a complicated age. I simply cannot imagine being interrupted by text messages going nowhere. Do you know how we got to be great communicators? Okay, I'm going to tell you a joke. Kick your shoes off, relax. This is one of those easy sermons to listen to. A man in North Carolina dug down 20 feet and found a copper cable, and he therefore said that his ancestors in North Carolina had a communication system 500 years ago. Well, the man in California, not to be outdone, dug down 30 feet and he found two copper cables. And so he said that his ancestors out there had been able to not only communicate, but they could communicate back and forth in real time since they had a cable that went out and one that came back. Well, then there was a guy in Alabama, which, by the way, this joke is directed that way because my brother lives in Alabama and he thinks he's really smart, Bubba. Okay? So, <laughs> so the guy in Alabama dug down 30 feet and he didn't find any cables at all. So he therefore concluded that his ancestors had a wireless communication network. <laughs> I think we feel the same way about God. We assume certain things from one fact or another. God is a great communicator. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. By the way, first, if you want the verification of that last, it's in the, in the Gospel of John, starting with chapter 1, verse 1. And it tells how Jesus did all of this. I would have to say that the entire Bible, and I've read it through many, many, many times, I would have to say that the entire Bible is a record of God's self-revelation to people just like you and I, his attempt in love to communicate God's message to us. Now, has God ever talked to you? Say yes. Right here it is. 
This is how God talks to us today. This is how we know that things are true and real. Did you catch those verses from Hebrews especially? He used to use prophets, ordinary guys. Now he uses Jesus, the one who rose from the grave, supernaturally. Who does Jesus use? Got a mirror? You're looking at him. <laughs> You're looking at him. And Jesus uses us. So what's prayer? That's got to be a form of communication. That's us talking back to God. What do you do at the end of your prayers? You close your mouth, you close your eyes, and you listen. Do you have to close your eyes? No. Can you pray with your eyes open? Yes. Can you pray without kneeling down? Yes. Can you pray standing on one leg in a bathing suit? Yes. You sure you can. God doesn't set standards like he did in the Old Testament where, they, where the, the shrew bread, the, the bread in the temple was holy. Anybody that touched it was guilty of a major crime. That's not true today. This is for real, and it feeds us spiritually. we got to be great communicators because we're in the likeness of God. In fact, I take a whole bunch of books, and what I don't take in, in terms of subscriptions, I tend to spend a lot of money on, <laughs> unfortunately, and magazines and scientific journals and all kinds of things. So one guy decided to find out if God was real using a CAT scan. So I put the different people as subjects under this CAT scan. You ever had a CAT scan? Okay, my best advice is, I hate those things, but I'm slightly claustrophobic anyway. Right? <laughs> but what it is basically is they put you in a Pringles tube and turn on the electricity until your hair stands on end. All right? Then they look at this picture full of blobs and globs and everything, and they say, you're normal or you're not normal, okay? On me, when I had it done, how many times have I had that done lately? I don't remember. I think I had at least six last year. I got so tired of being electrified, all those operations I was going through. My best advice is I hate those things, okay? Guess what he did? Put him under the CAT scan, started making pictures of their brain, and he would read scripture passages, and every time he did, one tiny section of the brain would light up, and he came to this conclusion. It didn't light up under any other circumstances he could duplicate. And he said, and he's telling us now, I believe that God has hardwired us for communication. So do I. Didn't you ever have a feeling all of a sudden you put the brakes on what you were doing and said, whoa, I can't do this, this is wrong? So have I. So it's God. God's talking to you. <coughs> Prayer is your answer back. How many of you ever had a toothache and thank God for the toothache? One of the hardest things I've had to do over this past year with a tremendous pain in this left leg of mine. I'm standing on one leg now practicing being eager. Next thing you know, I'll be taking up fishing along the river. My point of this is that God has a special need to talk to us and we've got a special need to verbally talk back to God and say, I'm listening, God, go ahead. You turn this receiving set in in your brain the minute you accept Jesus the Christ. The Holy Spirit comes on you at your baptism, and that's what happens to you. When Jesus returned from the dead, one of the very first things that he did was to urge his people to become communicators both with God and with other people. He said, don't forget your Lord. And he said, go out and talk to people. He said, I'm going to commission you. Go to the ends of the earth and tell them about me. The Father, God, and the Son, Jesus. Tell them about me. And then take their confession of me and then baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Find it at the end of Matthew, a lot of other places in the Bible. But I point this out to you because we've got a job to do 
and we're not always doing it. Do I understand all there is to know about this wonderful communication of God? Absolutely not. But that doesn't mean it doesn't work. For the life of me, I never figured out two things about this. Number one, it's free. Why didn't everybody accept it? And number two, how come when I talk to teenagers, I can't penetrate their thinking? I raised a house full of teenagers. How come my parents couldn't talk to me? I wouldn't listen to them either. Don't you dare do this. Well, that was a challenge. You better believe I had to try it out. Didn't you? Aren't we all alike? I've never been able to understand the difficulties in life. And the minute I asked people about that, I said, have you talked to God in prayer about this? Well, no, never thought about that. Why not? Because we don't put our God first. We put everything else first. They look at me oftentimes, people who've never had experiences in church, and they look at me and they say, if I'm crazy, I think, what is this, some sort of voodoo? No. No, this is God. This is the creator of the world. Okay? I'm not a stupid person. And I, I'm very single-minded. I, I read everything I lay my hands on, and I can stack my degrees up against yours, too. I don't mean a thing. What means something is what's in this book. Now, if you had to choose the single most important area in this communication area, what would you choose? First thing I thought of was some guy sitting in a missile silo with his finger on the button. Scared me to death. Wow. How about a direct line to police communication so that you can be protected against everything instantly? Boy, in today's times with the home break-ins, <laughs> that's not a bad idea. How about a bedtime monitor for your new baby? Notice I didn't say the second and third baby, I said the new one. Why? Because by the time the second one comes by, you can't find the batteries for the monitor, and by the time the third one comes by, you forget how it worked anyway, even if you had the batteries. All right? Never even had one for the second and third kid, did we? Our, our albums of our family, okay? Teresa was the first. So I've got all kinds of pictures of her. Kathy got two pages, Mike got one. Hey, that's true. That's true. I'll tell you where I think the most important communications are found. I really do. It's in the home. It really is. My wife and I, since I've gone deaf, we've had to learn a whole new means of communication. Right? Okay. We've learned how to have the most violent of arguments while we're smiling. <laughs> Listen, marriage itself is a direct result of communication process. Did you ever hear the song across the crowded room? Oh, it goes on and out, and they're sitting there across a crowded room, and suddenly they see their love, and they're in love, and it's head over heels, and it's going to last forever, and it's going to be so beautiful, and it's going to be exactly perfect, and they're never going to have any problems anymore, right? What nonsense. <laughs> what nonsense. We've been together 50, 6, 7, 8 years. Wow, it's a long time. You sure it's not a hundred? <laughs> and we still argue. Well, don't you? Surely we're not alone. Of course we do. By the way, girls are real smart. They're way smarter than boys, okay? They are. Listen, they've got a built-in ability to make boys blind and deaf and dumb. Dumb not and stupid, just dumb in the sense they can't even talk anymore. They accomplish these things through their own good sense. 
So what does the poor guy do the minute the girl turns on the charm? He goes down to the jewelry store, buys a ring, brings it back, kneels down in front of her and says, will you marry me? What's the first thing the girl does besides say yes? She gets herself down to the same jewelry store and has the ring appraised. Why? Because she's practical and he isn't. He's off on his rocker somewhere and she's being as practical as she can be. To reduce this, everything that we do as husband and wife is a form of communication. After they say, I do, a touch communicates feelings, a kiss. Holding hands, a smile, a frown, all of that is communication. And our loved one comes to expect it and know exactly how we feel all the time. We had dinner the other day together. Nice little dinner out, okay? We're forced to eat out a lot of times. There's simply enough time in our day to be able to go home and cook sometimes, okay? So we're sitting there. We had a good conversation. We never said a word. How does that happen? It happens because that's what happens to married people. You begin to understand one another. A touch, a word, a feeling. So what this man and this woman are agreeing to do by agreeing to get married is they're agreeing to communicate together for a lifetime in spite of the arguments and the silly things that happen. And what happens when the communications between husband and wife break down? Bingo. No more marriage, no more love, no more way to bridge the gap because we've destroyed the bridge. What do you think happens with God? Isn't it exactly the same thing? So often we want to destroy the bridge. So how do marriages fail? Let me count the ways. How about Proverbs 18.21? says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they are. Isn't it possible to hurt feelings so bad that the person whose feelings you hurt never wants to speak to you again? Of course. I never will forget one terribly abused woman long ago who came to me for some advice. And I asked her about how she handled things and she says, well, I can't afford to make him mad. Why? Because he reacted with violence. Other marriages fail because communication fails. One or both parties become inappropriate. They use no compliments. They just give sassy back talk and hate. And marriages fail during emotional outbursts. Listen, you can have those, but you're limited to only one a year, and you have to say, I'm sorry, afterwards, if you want it to last. Watch out for righteous attitudes. The same thing that affects the marriage affects our relationship out there with other people. And you can't have a righteous attitude and say, well, <clears throat> I go to church, but I noticed you don't. Oh, come on. What's happened to us? Listen, the stubborn man never admits to any mistakes at all. It's always the fault of the wife or kids, right? My wife taught me that one. <laughs> She's right and I'm wrong. I don't want to hear any more about it. <laughs> Isn't that the way it is at your house? Never insult your mate and her family or his family. Never. I was standing in the classroom with a loud mother. I've taught school, grade school for a long, long time. All different areas, including special education, principal, coach, teacher, you name it. The mother turns to me and the child is standing there. Now this is a 12 year old girl. And the mother says, I told her that outfit made her look fat. She wouldn't listen to me. And my first thought was to grab the mother and say, why do you think she didn't listen? <laughs> because she hurt so bad, it went too deep. Remember the proverb in the first sermon? That's where I get this from. A soft answer turns away wrath. A soft answer. Or how about this one? 
The wife looks at the husband and says through clenched teeth, if your mother tells me one more time how to bake a cherry pie, I'm just going to scream. <laughs> What's one of the main purposes of us being in church? Hmm? Isn't it to help one another? To bear the burdens? To learn love in place of hate? To learn how to be soft-spoken instead of full of anger? Listen, we came in, it's time we leave with some Bible facts that we've overlooked lately. Stop being shy with this. Ask God for help. You know why? I demand it. I don't just go to God and say, oh, please, God, have mercy on me. I go to God and I say, I need help now, God. Let's get on the stick. Let's move. How come I can do that? Here it is, Hebrews 4.16. Come boldly to the throne of God, and I will be rewarded with God's mercy in my condition and God's help when I'm in need. That's a New English translation. I love it. Accept human frailty for what it is. You guys perfect? I'm perfect, you know. I've been telling you for years. No, of course I'm not. Of course I'm not. Romans 3.23. How do we know that? For all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us. And that includes preachers. And I've often thought I'm allowed to fill this pulpit because I know what sin is when I talk about it. Husbands, wives, kids, in-laws, outlaws, and all those other relatives. Let's have a little forgiveness. We're all victims in our own way. And if God can forgive us, then we ought to be able to forgive one another. Let's develop a concern for the feelings of others. Well, shouldn't we? I'm coming up to Harmony yesterday. I'm on a motor scooter. Okay. Now that's a hot little motor scooter and it runs about 70 miles an hour and it almost makes me happy. 80 would be better. Now, I'm behind two great big bearded guys on big Harley Davidson hogs. Okay? As they turned off to go on another part of the road, one of them turned back to me, saw what was behind them, and sneered. <laughs> I almost jacked that thing wide open and roared around just to show them I could pass them. <laughs> I had concern for their feelings because that's not a godly feeling. In the Bible, what does Jesus say about kids? Jesus is sitting down and he's got a whole crowd around him and he's trying to preach and teach and the little kids come crowding forward and they all want to touch him and be with him. And the disciples, they grab the kids and get back here, get back in place, get back. And Jesus stopped them and he said, you suffer these children to come up to me. Because unless you are like the child in the same innocence, you're not going to get close enough. Suffer the little children to come unto me. Those kids have feelings too. Do they always make sense? Good grief, no. I didn't make sense when I argued with my folks. Let's practice the fine art of forgiveness. Luke 6, 37, if we forgive others, we'll be forgiven by God. But it goes way deeper than that. We need to learn how to forgive other people. <coughs> learn to apologize. One of the hardest things in the whole world is learning how to say you're sorry to people that you've mistreated. And it takes courage and faith and grace and abundance. And the only place you're going to get that is from God. You have to do it. It's part of the process of forgiveness. For goodness sakes, learn to listen. Learn to listen to your mates and your kids and your friends and your relatives. Hear what they're really saying and support them with love instead of trying to contradict them at every step of the way. 
you have to be very careful about this. Finally, learn to listen to God. When you're all done with everything, you're done with the prayers and you're faced the wall and the firing squad is standing there ready to shoot their little bullets at you one way or the other, then isn't it time you learn to listen to God and what he's got to say? Be still and ask God to talk to you and he will. You'll get a distinct feeling of guidance and care. Your life, your loves, your Bible, it's all important. The most important thing is your heart. It is. Listen, in spite of our ability to communicate over vast distances, all the devices in this entire world cannot convey real love unless Jesus is included in our lives. And it's that simple. I'm done with this sermon. What I hope happens is to remember these things, not just because we've suddenly gotten older and we don't feel like fighting as much anymore, but because we're all young at heart and we're in Christ and we want to present Christ first in our lives. And that's important, okay? That's important. I invite you to come back next Sunday with your mothers in tow if they're living and their memories with you if not. Bring a friend, bring two or three, okay? And join us, we've got some things to give away to mothers, especially, okay? But come because you want the honor being born again. In effect, you've adopted a new motherhood. In effect, you've adopted Jesus the Christ. And by being born again, you've changed your life. I invite you to Christ. We stand and sing our hymn of invitation, first and last verse, 148. <laughs> and keep us. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Guide us in the pathway of Christ that love prevails. Guide us so that Jesus is personified in our lives and return us to worship again another day. In the name of Jesus, we humbly pray. Amen. The good Lord bless and keep you whether near or far away. May you find that long-awaited golden day today. May your troubles all be small ones and your fortune die.